Hello and welcome to this second session of the Introduction to Machine Learning with Google Crowdsource, hosted by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Google Developer Student Group. Um, this is uh, a complex topic, neural networks, and it's one that is, uh, I think, intimidating. And I think that intimidation is in evidence um, here today. <laughs> um, but before that gets going, let me start off by uh, saying that this session is going to be is recorded and it's going to be shared on the um, uh, the YouTube channel of the uh, developer group and will be shared more widely by Google Crowdsource and maybe shared by other Google outlets. So don't say anything you wouldn't say publicly because this is public. Um, okay, let me recap uh, what happened last time, last week, um, when we ran the first introduction to machine learning because the lessons that we learned in that, in that session will now be important for us going forward. Okay, so uh, let's start off, I'll start off by introducing, introducing myself, reintroducing myself. Uh, I'm Gregory McGann. Um, I'm the lead of the developer, student developer group uh, at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I'm a master's student of demography and global health. Um, I am also, um, uh, I also work for the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs um, in the uh, Division for Inclusive Sustainable Development. Um, so I've been working in that capacity for the UN for several years and in machine learning for um, maybe two years, maybe two or three years. And this program is designed to take um, the learnings of Google AI, which is kindly um, leading this program, along with Google Crowdsource and the um, application behind Google Crowdsource. It's a website, it's also a mobile phone application for Android, and help others be introduced to machine learning, particularly those who could benefit from uh, benefit from it and apply it to their own work. So, in our in our example of being here in the London School of, School of um, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, I almost forgot the name there. People do that all the time. Mm. Um, <clears throat> there is clearly enormous scope for machine learning, deep learning, and gen and other AI topics to make a serious impact. There's clearly a, there are clearly uh, enormous reservoirs of data that can be used to train models. And I think there's a general hunger, both in the public and private sector, for um, machine learning in the uh, health space. So there's a, a huge opportunity, which has been recognized by these several programs, uh, supporting, supporting us, supporting this community, supporting this um, program of learning, which will run through the whole year, and um, maybe beyond. Um, although that will be for someone else to take up and uh, <laughs> go through this process of teaching. Okay, so what did we learn last week about um, machine learning? Um, we were introduced to the concept of machine learning. What does it, what does it uh, mean? Um, is it AI? No, AI is, as a general and in my opinion, less useful term for um, what amounts to mimicry of what were believed to be specifically human mental faculties. So this could be um, learning purely from inference. And this is, uh, I think I've captured there in that specific example, um, the essence of ML, machine learning, which is essentially just um, learning from inference learning from large quantities of data. And then on top of that, the process of having a, uh, of training a model, uh, testing it on data. So splitting your data, training your training a model, testing that model and iteratively improving. And in fact, automating that iterative improvement, that is the essence of machine learning. And so it does this process almost autonomously. Fortunately for ML engineers, it's not totally autonomous. And we'll learn today just how important humans, thankfully, still are in this process. Um, okay, so we've got a definition of machine learning. 
And we talked a little bit about um, uh, the next stage, which is deep learning, quote unquote, deep learning, which is a subset of ML. ML is a subset of AI and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So deep learning is the usage of artificial neural networks. Note the use of the word artificial uh, for nonlinear transformations of data at increasing levels of abstraction. Let me break that down as I did last time. Um, artificial, just to note that it's not human because the other neural network is human or animal brains. And then the um, nonlinear transformation. This is something we're going to get we're going to get into. At the moment, it's it's sufficient to know that um, there are multiple different transformations happening at any point, possibly. And this is these are the layers that we'll refer to in the network. Calm down. We'll get to it later. <laughs> and then increasing levels of abstraction. So this refers to the way in which deep learning is increasingly handles tasks of a complexity that is beyond the the uh the scale at which humans can operate so maybe it's a task that is uh humans simply don't have a time to operate it will take a human a thousand years a team of a million humans a thousand years to do this so we can't do it but then it's also referring to this process of iterative improvement which um is done at, done at a speed and a scale that cannot be replicated by humans so now you're actually looking kind of at a black box and saying what are we putting into the black box because once it's in there, we don't know what it's doing, really. And if any of you saw the um, very interesting, uh, I'm, just, I'm just gonna say interesting, but interesting um, comments um, or leaks that came from Facebook, uh, you'll have seen many of the uh, engineers discussing the algorithm, which was of their own creation and the results of which they did not fully understand. And if you want to understand this way in which uh, unexpected outcomes can occur, I would recommend looking into something called complexity science, specifically um, um, something called uh, the Santa Fe Institute, which is the leading authority on complexity science. And this, they deal with a lot of the network algorithms that are going to inform a lot of what we're doing with these neural networks. Okay, okay, I think that was that was last week in broad strokes. So. If you're not already intimidated, <laughs> um, hopefully you're, you're, you're still not intimidated. Okay, so to soften you up, we're going to watch uh, a video. Um, without further ado, let me get to the video and watch it. It's, hopefully, it's a it's a it's a Google, uh, it's a video with Google ML engineers about uh, what machine learning with uh, machine learning and deep learning with artificial neural networks is okay cool. hi I'm Nat and I'm Lo and this is our 20% project where we go find out about different Google stuff we're curious about last year we got to make a documentary about how voice search works and that was the first time we heard about something called machine learning since then, we've been kind of fascinated by it. So today we're talking with Greg and Chris to learn more about it. How would you describe machine learning to someone? Well, there's a lot of problems it's really easy to solve. Oops. Hi, I'm Nat. And I'm Lo. Sorry, and this just is our 20% stuff learning. Stuff. Since then, we've been kind of fascinated by it. So today we're talking with Greg and Chris to learn more about it. How would you describe machine learning to someone? Well, there's a lot of problems it's really easy to solve with computers. Computers can go and like simulate how galaxies move and how the courses of asteroids going and how close they're gonna come to Earth. I could never hope to go and do that, but I can go and do this, this problem like recognizing that that's a tree, which is so much tremendously more difficult for a computer. It doesn't feel like intelligence to us because it's so effortless as a human being to do it. But for a computer, it's actually really hard. Because the real world is kind of messy and unpredictable at times. The strict logical rules that go into traditional programming just don't work. 
instead of going and, and writing programs to, that solve the problem, we, we write programs that learn to solve the problem from examples. And it's this process of learning that allows them to improve over time and to actually be more clever than they would be if we wrote down a very rigid set of instructions for them to follow. Machine learning is in so many different things that we use today that it's kind of like this invisible magic ingredient. Phones with the ability to understand human speech. Machine translation, email spam filters. When you go to the ATM and you give a check and it can read the handwriting. Or a photos app that can automatically organize your photos based on the things that you like to take photos of. Like, here are all my mountain photos. Here are all my food photos. Here, here are all my dog photos. Here are all my feet photos. <laughs> Everything from facial recognition to going and trying to recognize whether a particle is present in a particular collision at the LHC. Which we would just like to take a time out to say is that big tube in the ground over in Europe that smashes particles together at really fast speeds so that scientists can use that information to unlock the mysteries of the universe, among other cool things. Now back to our episode, because I am getting really dizzy doing this. Ooh, ooh. So researchers and scientists are still experimenting and trying to find the best ways to teach computers how to learn. But a lot of the progress is coming from these algorithms that are based roughly on how the human brain works, and these are called artificial neural networks. So an artificial neural network is something that it's a rough mathematical cartoon of, of how a biological neural network works. In a biological brain, we have individual cells called neurons. Each neuron looks at what its neighbors has to say and then decide what it wants to say. And in artificial neural networks, we have little mathematical functions. We put them in some organized st structure, and then we say, OK, you guys all together, learn to do this task. We have lots of neural nets that are really great at going and recognizing, you know, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a frog, this is a mouse, this is a horse, this is a truck, and things like that. So take, for example, trying to recognize what this is. So it used to be that we were really proud if we could get a neural net with three layers to work. Um, and it's recently that we've made a lot of progress on techniques that allow us to train much deeper neural nets. And that's why this kind of machine learning is also called deep learning. A neuron in the bottom layer is just going to be looking at a tiny piece of the picture and making some computations about it. It doesn't understand anything about dogs specifically. But what the neuron does understand is it says, I'm giving a signal that's useful for somebody who's giving a signal, who's giving a signal, who's giving a signal, who's giving a signal. They're kind of able to unfurl this really high dimensional knot and pull it apart and make it easier to go and, and uh, you know, separate different things that are, are, are close together on the surface from things that are, are, were tangled all together earlier. But then at the top, we'll put two neurons and these neurons look at the whole picture so far. They're basically experts at making the final call, figuring out, oh, all the layers below me said these things, so I know that this is a dog, or at least I'm 92.4% sure that it's a dog, so it's basically a dog. And while there's been a whole lot of progress with teaching computers to learn, they're still much slower learners than we are, and they make mistakes that you and I wouldn't. So what I was working on is sort of trying to find a way to go and look at a neural net and ask, what does the neural net think the platonic ideal of a cat is, or the platonic ideal of a dog, or anything it can classify as? And suddenly you can go and ask, you know, neural net, what do you think a cat looks like? And you get a picture of a cat, or, you know, neural net, what do you think a barbell looks like? So these weights. And it, it, it goes and it shows you a picture not only of a barbell, but of an arm attached to a barbell. So the model thought that the arms, you know, it, it only learned what barbells were from looking at pictures of barbells, and they're often held by muscular weightlifters. And so, so it, it learned that there was, you know, barbells have arms attached to them. It takes them a long time to learn. You show it a picture of a school bus when it's early in learning. The very next time you show it a picture of a school bus, it's only a little bit more likely to say school bus. It doesn't get it, even though that was the very last thing it saw. Whereas, you know, you say to a kid, you know, that's a filing cabinet. And then a second later you say, what's that? Yeah. He's not going to be like, shoo, right? You know. Well, like, <laughs> the more you describe this, the more I'm amazed by human beings. <laughs> Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the effect is like, wow, human beings are really amazing. We're really amazing learning machines. Okay. So I think uh, now. 
you've you've watched that video you get a sense of a, a small sense of what this is about i mean that was an interesting video in some sense but it provided a uh, very very um abstract sense of what a, a neural network is and what its uses are interesting seeing one of those guys reference uh, platonic philosophy in in relation to machine learning he referred to the the machine idea of a of a um or whatever it is the object as as the platonic idea which is is an interesting interpretation okay so we've had that little little introduction now you have a uh, a visual aid for it um and if you have any comments please do um feel free to put them in the in the chat i am watching the chat so um i will try and re reply as quickly as, as as i can um okay so that's giving you a sense of um a sense of the way in which machines are mimicking uh humans so before we had in norm in quote unquote normal machine learning it's inference basically by things like regression uh, and it's 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 clear extrapolation from the statistical methods we all will have learned in our masters or undergraduate degrees and um this takes it a step further and it's it uh, tries to mimic the uh biological functions of the brain but that's not really enough i mean i've always found that to be quite an unsatisfying conclusion because it's you know you, you have this idea in your mind about well that's how the brain functions but how does it actually work well um i think the way to think about this is and this is my personal definition <laughs> is that it's the way the, the reason why it's layered is so that you can have um many many simple models knitted together at different stages if it was one if you imagine one layer it would be it's it's apply, then it would apply um it all simultaneously so waiting would be difficult which is something very important and uh it, it would i think the, the, the reason it's layered is because it will be it's then you can better iterate and you can prioritize features and the way iteration often manifests itself through neural networks is by waiting so each one of these neurons they so called is actually just a mathematical function and um a neural network is just a system of mathematical if you imagine there's an there's an input and it will often be the case we'll explore this but it will be the case that it's simply a yes or no is it is this bit i'm looking at this task that i'm assigned to each neural network each each neuron it is this thing red or not red if it's red it will be yes if it's not red it will be no and what you're seeing here is the blue is the line of its of the correct response or the response connected to um uh something that can kind of better inform the output so if you said okay you had a picture of an animal and you had your color one of your features was color and it will and one of them and the color came out gray now initially your 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 neural network would have a very hard time putting anything any of this together it would just random sort of essentially be rubbish it just would it would just um uh make a guess but as you te test it and show it's incorrect what you're able to do is show it which one of those random choices was actually better so if it's gray what should i ask next if it's gray does it have tusks that will be a good that will be a good one to link why because there are probably to my knowledge there are two gray animals rhinoceroses and elephants i'm sure there are other gray animals 
but and rhinoceroses don't have tusks so what you'll be able to find is that that will be good at differentiating between outputs and you're more likely to get the correct one i hope that's that's okay let's let's go on to the next one okay this, these are the um, activation functions uh, i think i think it's better to stay on this one just for a second because we get more of an idea of um what what what's going on yeah so deep just means layered how many layers are there that's why it's called deep learning um these mathematical functions can be forms of analysis that we're already familiar with um so this could be regression for instance um and the number of neurons will be linked to the complexity of the data you have and by the way complexity in this case doesn't just mean quantity it means if you can imagine tabular data it will be rows and columns so how many features have you okay we so we call these features we'll see this later but a lot of what we do is feature engineering so how do we pose the right questions in the neural network this is very crucial the neural network will itself help us choose the right ones but we do need something to begin with and often we start with information but we may be able to add, add more okay so you're thinking what are these mathematical functions and that's what this slide is activation functions activation just means when it hits the neuron what does it do does it does it fire or does it not fire does it activate or not activate activate means it goes through not activate means it doesn't go through okay so um not go through means it's it's uh reducing the number of options so if you imagine it it looks like a funnel if you imagine if you visualize it it looks like a funnel so you're getting fewer and fewer linkages until finally you only have one option which in our case would be like does it have does it have tusks and then once once you know it doesn't have once you know it doesn't have tusks you think it's a rhinoceros um but now we can have a little bit, a bit of history a bit of history of, of, of machine learning and deep learning because this top one here we have is a sigmoid function um which is was the earliest used uh, for deep learning and then we had the rectified linear unit which is the more commonly used now in fact it's almost universally used in, in my experience um yeah research, researchers describe the field of uh, machine learning like uh exploration uh for example a long uh for a long time the sigmoid activation function was used um but in the end it was it was abandoned because of the efficiency of the relu function and by the way just keep in contact con context of this what we spoke about in the first lecture which is the uh distinction between rules and um inference or machine learning as we discovered a lot of a lot of machine learning is the combination between rules and kind of inference sometimes called machine learning confusingly um but the takeaway from that was that when uh machine learning was in its infancy and it was dominated by rules it didn't get very far new machine the reason this analogy with ex exploration exists is because it's it refers to the trial and error and the practical nature of AI. This is not a precise science. This really is kind of the, the, the discipline itself is iteratively improving. And it's improving in a way that is in a sense blind. I mean, that's that's the essence of machine learning. It's just it doesn't come in with assumptions and it doesn't function according to is this um is this right or wrong? It just it takes the inference. And we so 
we adopt Relu not because it's um, necessarily quote unquote better, but because it's more efficient. It's, it's significantly easier to compute. Um, and as you'll see here, you can you can immediately deduce from this from the graphing of of these um, sigmoid and um, rectified linear unit functions that the uh, the relu is is uh, will be would, would consume cons significantly less more um, no sorry less computational power just by look just by eyeballing it you can see that um, uh, you, you don't need to do some of the more complex computational tasks on it. That's a shorthand way of saying it, but one of the things that we'll see, and which I referred to previously, is that in the first lecture, is that although we are doing machine learning and we will do machine learning, these statistical probabilistic, um, this statistical probabilistic work that lies behind machine learning is largely known, is, not, is largely a sort of trivial fact for us because we will be using APIs, application um, programming interfaces, to access these algorithms uh, remotely. We will be able to essentially query them without really understanding them. That's one of the reasons machine learning is, the, the uptake of machine learning has been so great recently, is that somewhat, somewhat the, the intellectual pain has been taken out of it. And things like TensorFlow, Keras API, which we will deal with in a minute, are have in a sense taken these kind of equations outside the hands of the users and allowed you merely to iteratively improve your model by chopping and changing which one you use and you'll quickly find that trial and error is your <laughs> your best friend if you if you want to use machine learning in your work you won't require a phd in statistics the kind of thing that generates the intuitions to understand this slide. Um, all you'll need is uh, a tenacity to continue and try out new things. And um, I think that's the, that's the lesson of machine learning generally, the rules-based approach, which was the theory level approach, was um, unsuccessful. And the iterative trial and error approach, which is more accessible, uh, was, was successful. Okay, long digression. Let's go and let's 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 break this down. So what you see here is one of the the, the, the neuron functions. So this is one of the mathematical functions. So if you imagine that this was this is what's inside the neuron, we can kind of forget this now, and then you can then you can break it into a sort of the, the decision tree, as it were, sort of flowchart, which will be familiar to any student of of computer science. And probably any 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 science, in fact, um, of input output. So this is just a function, and we can just treat it as a function. So let's take our example. I slightly jumped the gun by mentioning it, but um, elephants and rhinoceroses. Our input is it's grey. The previous neuron has said color. Which color fired grey? And then the activation function is does it have does it have horns? Or it could be does it have a horn either one of those and in fact if both of those were neurons it would be it would be re replications it wouldn't be so good because it led to the same conclusion but if you had if you had both of those it would then lead it would then confirm so your activation function in this sense would be um does it have does it have tasks yes activate the neuron pass on that decision fire ask another question or just conclude you've got your result you know if we go if we go back to our original if you imagine your funnel your your layers decreasing in number and then you have your conclude you have your output your final output this could be your final output you only, you only need one layer and in fact that would really wouldn't be deep learning that would just be machine learning but um okay If you're a programmer, you might actually recognize this as a kind of um, if statement. Um, so if red, then, and um, a, a lot of this will be familiar to logicians, people who've done philosophy or mathematics at 
um, any level, they will see in this a reflection of the fundamental underlying um, logic of uh, mathematics and philosophy. Um, okay, that's next slide. Here we have an example. Five. Is it less than ten? Yes. Activate the next neuron. Uh, unhelpful example because these um, uh, atomized pixel ones of numbers don't any of them have curves. But it's a it's a seven. Does it have a curve? No, do not activate neuron. Okay. So this in our example, it would not be passing it on. Does six have a curve? Does it have a curve? Doesn't look to me like it has a curve. In this example, apparently it does have a curve. So, um, yeah. Okay, so the favorite thing to do is um, image recognition computer vision. Oh, we've got a comment. Um, Amrane, sorry, I'm, I'm probably horribly butchering your name. Um, Akinator, old online game Akinator. No, I never heard of it. Do tell, I, I want to hear more about this Akinator. Um, okay. Um, okay, let's look at this. Uh, can everyone hear me correctly, by the way? Good. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, imagine if I went through this whole thing and I, I wasn't, I wasn't, there was no sound. In fact, what would happen is I'd just have the video, Google will send it back to me and be like, dub it all over with your voice. <laughs> And um, yeah, that's what would happen. But that would have been very time consuming for me. So, okay. Um, so this is um, an example of a neural network. And we're going to introduce a new term, which is hidden layer. So um, the second layer here is a so-called hidden layer. And as you can see, it's, um, it's taking the outputs of the first layer and trying to um, pose a new question, which is, is it this? And it has its idea of uh, a tiger cat, a beagle, a Labrador retriever, a lynx and a tennis ball. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but the, the lynx uh, is actually, is, it, it seems to me like the lynx is actually actually a schnauzer. <sighs> but um, that's kind of like the, uh, well, actually we have a, the, it might not be showing the whole of the network, but if, if this is indeed the whole network, it's, you can see that it's playing fast and loose of the idea of lynx. And tennis ball, in fact, you can see the last, the bottom right of the second layer. That is a tennis ball, I think. But what you can see also is that these are kind of invented images. So the image recognition, what they've done actually is they've created a composite image. So this is what it means when it said increasing levels of abstraction. We have no idea what these composite images are. So one of the funny things you find with computer vision is when you, when you actually look into these layers, which have been added and have actually been helpful in deciding what something is, you look at it and think that is a grotesque thing. That's some sort of bizarre, um, bizarre amalgam that doesn't really make sense. Um, and yet it's useful in predicting. And so that's the black box. That's, that's the, it's, it's doing something that's helping get an output we want. It's, testing successfully, it's iterating successfully, but it's going to a level of abstraction that we kind of lose sight of. And you immediately find this, this, this trap hole, which we are concerned with in AI ethics, and which concerns us, of course, intimately here, which is kind of losing control. And we don't, we don't, you know, it's clearly not a lynx. 
Uh, that's barely a tennis ball. God knows what a tiger cat is. Um, um, I suppose that's just a tiger, but they've called it tiger cat, presumably because of the inputs have names attached to them. Um, and then they sort of ag aggregated the name, doesn't it? Um, yeah, so looking at this slide, Shall we, maybe it's better, no, let's this down this one. Um, what we discussed earlier, waiting, is but it will be, will be important. When you're deciding whether uh, this image on the left, you can see it's actually of a cat and a dog. So what, what, what will be important in deciding whether this is an image of a, a dog or a cat? This is when it was used. If it was, if this was a physical workshop, we'd have people holding up their hands, maybe guessing. But um, it's not space. In fact, could it be? Because sometimes when you're deciding what a picture is of, it's of what it's mainly of. So space could be important. So what is the shape? Um, uh, what is the biggest shape that could be something? Um, what is the background? As you can see here, so it's kind of picked up green, uh, and that's not a problem because everything's behind green. It must have the information behind this neural network must have uh, it must have Labrador retrievers behind uh, green grass. And it, it, that I have I, I imagine this would be much more complex if there were lots of different backgrounds. Do you see what I'm saying? Because then it would have to ask further questions: Is there an association between Labrador retrievers, golden Labrador retrievers, and green. Is it if it's green? Is it a golden Labrador? But in this case, it seems like they're all green. You can sort of see um, all of the options are green, and so we, we're led to believe that um, it's been trained on data that where there was there was no conflict or it's sort of universal. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's, you can play around at this. There's some uh, apps on the um, crowdsource uh, app, which you can get on Android, which you don't have to do, or you can go on a website. It's free, there's no, there's no cost to it, where you can kind of experiment with some of these, um, some of these important um, functions. And you can kind of see how things would be chosen or not chosen. And you can try and defeat, like what the most important, the most uh, useful thing you could do is you could try and defeat the model. You could try and, you could try and see what it was getting right, like dog, and then see if you could take a picture of a dog which it didn't recognize. And then you can think about, why didn't it recognize this picture of a dog? Was it contextually different? Is this, is this a different sort of dog? Is it a different color dog, et cetera? That's a machine learning question. That's not necessarily a neural network question. But um, what we're going to learn from today, and because I've been uh, huffing and puffing for so long, and not saying and not moving quickly enough, um, we're only getting this stage now to the kind of exercises. What you're seeing before you, the scary thing you're seeing before you, is um, the TensorFlow playground. TensorFlow is one of the uh, libraries custom made for machine learning. It's run by Google. You don't have to use it. There's a, there's a, there are other different ones like um, PyTorch, which is very good, or Scikit-Learn. Um, but this one kind of breaks down um, the uh, how the, the back end. So when you're when you're accessing these websites. And you've put in your data, which generally what you're doing, you're just going to be doing is you're just going to put in your data and you're going to run one of these equations or you're going to run one of the libraries like TensorFlow and um, with its um, pre-built models and you get out, you get an output. This helps you understand kind of like the back end, what's actually going on and are we going to make a, uh, how do we make an informed um, decision we might write next time we'll write code next time which is next year now 
or write code to kind of describe this. But at the moment, this um, playground is um, a way to do it without code. Okay, so um, you can see here on the right, the output. And in general terms, just what you want to do here in this exercise is make sure blue is separate from orange. This would be even successfully separating uh, elephants from rhinoceroses. The blue would be elephants, let's, let's say. What you're always trying to do with machine learning is tag appropriate, differentiate appropriately. You're not necessarily trying to know everything. In fact, you're never trying to know everything. You could never, you're never being exhaustive. You're just, you're, you're just differentiating between things. I'm using differentiate very loosely here, not in a mathematical sense, but in more of the um, lit, uh, English language sense, which is just that you want to separate. This is why machine learning is sometimes said it's just about tagging. It's just about um, what is, is it this thing or is it not this thing? And if it's not this thing, is it this other thing? Not exhaustive, uh, not rules based, not trying to say what it is exactly, it's just what it's not. And this gives you a kind of visualization of that. And what we're going to be doing here is um, trying to separate them in a non linear way. So linear would just be function, function, function. If you imagine row, non linear is multiple rows so maybe you could have multiple columns um but you wouldn't have multiple rows okay let's go to the next slide um what is showing here are the features now in the last session we discussed features a little bit and feature engineering is one of the main jobs of the um, machine learning specialist, uh, machine learning engineer. And it basically describes um, first your starting point, and later what you want, maybe you want to iterate over. Um, if you were looking at cats and dogs, it would be these would be features. Fe the features would be characteristics like size, color, nose shape. <laughs> I, I guess I guess that's it. I mean, I'm not very familiar with cats, honestly. Um, but from a distance, I think they have different noses. <laughs> Dogs. Um, it could also be numbers. So, is it a higher or is it? Is, is it in a range? Is it higher or lower than something? Um, yeah. Okay. So now we're getting into the hidden layers. So we've got our explicit features. What the thing to bear in mind here is that when in our definition of um, neural networks deep learning we had in, we had at the very end levels of abstraction the abstraction is the hidden layers these are the things that are mysterious and we may not perfectly understand ourselves once the iteration gets going the features are explicit for us we know what the features are and we, we may know what the hidden layers are but they might be as we saw that comp those composite photos very mysterious to us. They might be very helpful, but they could also be something that the computer's picked up on and phrased in a way that is very hard for us to understand. But in this example, we are gonna try and do the computer's work, which we would never do. That's why we do machine learning, in fact, um, and guess the hidden layers for this spread of data. Okay, so can I, can I share this? Let me put this link in the chat just so you can kind of, 
I don't know if you can click on things on a on a presentation. Somehow I doubt it. I'm going to put it in the chat here. And there it is. That's the playground. So now we're going to do a little some or where you're going to do it. You're going to do the exercises. You're going to have a go at them. And bear in mind what um, when when you when you do it, it doesn't have it here. But when you do it, the website, as far as I remember, has additional um, settings you can toggle, <coughs> including batch size, uh, noise, which is just if you're familiar with handling data, you you're you're familiar with the signal to noise ratio. Signal is um, informative uh, data. Noise is kind of corrupted or otherwise irrelevant data. But you can ignore those, don't worry about those. Just focus on the features, the hidden layers and the output. Right. So here's your, here's your um, link, which I've put in the chat. Have a look at it. And now what we can do is, it should have opened up at this, this one, first neural network, your first neural network. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the, to the fun of neural networks. Maybe I should put this one in the chat as well. Um, it's the same link, but just so no one's confused. Um, Is everyone clear so far? There's only like three people, so. Um, are, are all of you clear so far on kind of, what are the hidden layers? These are the, good, excellent. Vern's okay with it. Uh, the hidden layers are the extra layers of abstraction required to refine the output, refine the uh, production, the accuracy. Accuracy is a loaded word, but. We're gonna we're, we're gonna go with accuracy right now. I wouldn't in another context. Complete tasks one to three. Be ready to share your findings. Yes, that's right. I'm going to embarrass you. <laughs> Don't worry, there aren't enough of us here to uh, justify that. But um, if you just want to look at it for a minute, um, I wonder if I can get out of this and look at it um, without breaking the machine, without incinerating it. I think it's still showing my PowerPoint, okay. Well, what you should see is um, a part of the machine learning crash course, which is by the way, probably the best dictionary for machine learning. It's not, you know, for me, a good course is one that gives you sort of like credit and um, pats you on the back when you do something. But if you just want a look up a dictionary, this machine learning crash course by Google, which is developers.google.com slash machine learning, machine hyphen learning slash, crash iPhone course is probably the best um uh dictionary i would say it is it's the best reference it while you're when you're starting out it certainly helped me a lot back in the day and what you should see if you scroll down is our old friend the 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 tensorflow playground and what you can see here is if we have like pluses and minuses you, you can sort of see that in the presentation as well plus and minus hidden layers and then plus and minus um, neuron. So if you imagine neuron is like a row and a hidden layer will be like uh, a column. If you want to visualize it in a, in, a, in, a, in a tabular way, which probably you don't, but I always do because I'm, I'm just, I'm still stuck in the dark age of Excel. So <laughs> um, now you can kind of see that it's, it's, it's difficult to get the, um, Difficult to get the, the 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 blue and the orange separate if you're just playing around with it. Perhaps I'm doing it on my own. I'm just howling at the dark. <laughs> um, and what you quickly find is this is a it's 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 difficult difficult to do. 
difficult to find a resolution. I'm just I'm just playing around a bit here. And I think what you want is uh, this is if you press regenerate on the left hand side, you'll be able to find that you'll be able to get a new random data set with which to play with. But it's confounding us by providing it. I think it will always provide it in this kind of uh, horizontal cross way right on either side, which is which would completely confound linear regressions. This, if you were if you drawing if you were, if you were approaching this in any other conventional machine learning way, it would uh, <laughs> it would crash and burn on 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 the rocks of this of this equation. But what I think you'll find is. that um, there's a way to get a reasonably good response on this one. My sense is though that the loss, the loss function is basically a way of capturing, uh, numerically capturing, quantifying um, the accuracy. Oh, it says here actually, um, the, the test loss, the training loss uh, is, is high. If you see below that, it's actually, I think is an answer. Okay, so the answer is the activation uh, is set to linear, so this model cannot learn any non-linearities. So what we were doing there actually was the very thing I was talking about, which was um, the high loss, pretty useless uh, linear function. Aha. So if you, yeah, on the top level, you'll see um, next to the play button, uh, epochs, which is just a sort of uh, iteration. Um, and then learning rate, activation, regularization, and regularization rate. What you want to change is linear to, uh, I would say ReLU. And see how it goes. Maybe this maybe this will help us more. We've got like I've just put it in. I've just I've just done it, and we've got down to zero point four uh, loss function, which isn't too bad. Which isn't too bad. We're going to move on in a minute, so don't <laughs> don't worry if this is uh, kind of going over your head, but. Um, Okay, so there are those. There are those three tasks. Oh, we've got. We've, okay. Task one is the model is given combines two features functions into a single neuron. Will this model learn any uh, non linearities? So now we know the answer. It will not learn non linearities because it was set to linear. I mean, the key is in the name. <laughs> Task two, try increasing the number of neurons in the hidden layer from one to two. Okay. So you should have one hidden layer and two neurons. What are you seeing? What I'm seeing is loss still very high still quite high still for me it's once i've made the adjustments it's still 0 0.527 so not very useful alas so we're now simulating the journey of the machine learning engineer frustrating as it is are you guys following this are you are you on the website it would be helpful if i um
uh, shared my screen. My, my. Okay, so now let's let, 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 let's let's do these little tasks. I don't think we're gonna be too few to do. You know, to have like a class presentation that might be a bit uh, not right. Um, task three: try increasing the number of neurons in the hidden layer from two to three using a nonlinear activation like Relu. We've got it on good old sigmoid. And now we're on relu. Okay. Actually, the loss function is, is basically unchanged. Playground's non deterministic nature shines through on this exercise. A single hidden layer of free neurons is enough to model the data absent noise, but not all runs will converge to a good model. Free neurons are good enough. But the XOR function can be expressed as a combination of three half planes reactivation. You can see this from looking at the neuron images, which show the output of the individual neurons. In a good model of free neurons and relu activation, there will be one image with an identical vertical, vertical line, detecting X1 being positive or negative, so it may, switch, may be switched. Um, remember, if you press regenerate, it will have generated a new sample, so this might not be true of you. Um, one image of an almost horizontal line detecting the sign of X2, and one image of a diagonal line detecting their interaction. Well, it hasn't done that. So, um, okay, vertical line. Line. Let's get rid of these. Now let's re-add them. Is that more simple? Is this mm, that's not quite horizontal? Vertical, not quite horizontal, the um diagonal. As this is this is the uh non-deterministic nature. Let's regenerate it, see what happens. This is when the computer crashes. So you get loss. You get losses, but losses, things, things. So this is actually the least loss. One neuron. And this is the most loss. This is ridiculous. Just playing around here now. This is not how we do machine learning, but it's it's kind of like it's it's an interesting thought experiment because you can kind of see what the computer is trying to will, will try to do in a trillion times in a matter of minutes or seconds. <laughs> that's an that's, that's an exaggeration. It can't do it a trillion times, but okay. Task four. Continue experimenting. Okay, we've we've been continuing so continuing to experiment. Um, by adding or removing layers and neurons per layer, feel free to change learning rates, regularization, and other learning settings. So what it wants you to do here, learning rates, is the iteration process. Let's go press play here. So let's get rid of that. Now it's trying to find it, okay. What we were doing was okay. okay. Pretty decent, zero point one eight with three. I mean, it's not quite doing what it says. This is not quite uh, horizontal. But by aggregating these these layers, so if you see what's happening here, 
if it's trying to find blue, it's it's consecutively drawing a line. Is it saying yes? Is it over this line and not over this line? And for two of the new ones, it's 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 not firing. And for one, it is. Let's wait there for a second. Zero point nine four. Minus zero point nine two. Minus zero point eight two. So you can see the way it's iteratively improving to prioritize this one because it is horizontal, isn't it? We'll stop that. <laughs> And this is this is why these sessions go on so long because it, it's it's a process it's a process does increasing the model size improve the fit or how quickly it converges does this change how often it converges to a good model for example try the following architecture okay first hidden layer with three new with three neurons okay we got three neurons first layer second layer with three neurons let's try that third layer of two neurons What did we have last time? I think this is done better. This is doing better. Hey, look at that. It's it's weighting it. Yeah, it's it's performing better. Let's look at the answer. Oh, whoops! We weren't meant to do question four. Oh well, oh well. God, I got carried away. It's just so fascinating. It's just so damn fascinating. Okay, okay, okay. Um, single hidden layer of free neurons can model the data, but there's no redundancy, so on many runs, it will effectively lose a neuron and not learn a good model. Ah, oh, that's a good point. So this is this is overfitting. Um, a single layer of more than three neurons has more redundancy and thus is more likely to converge to a good model. Well, I won't read out this great big passage to you, but the... Um, Takeaway is um, that an excessively complex neural network will result in uh, redundancy, which you don't want for your computational business. Because, by the way, a lot of the a lot of the computation you're going to be doing on these things is going to be on rented servers, and they charge money, <laughs> a lot of money. I mean, cloud. Can, if you imagine that. Uh, the, the, the cloud services that are now being developed by AWS and Google Cloud Platform, among many others, um, are uh, making most of their money from business applications of computational um, exercises like this. So a lot, a lot of money being, is being spent renting space. So you want to reduce redundancy. Okay, okay. I'm going to stop sharing that and go back to the presentation. Oops. Do we have time to do these ones? Let's quickly rush through these ones. I think we're getting somewhere. I'd like to do some coding, but perhaps we'll wait for next time because then we can have a more interactive class. I know neural networks is off-putting because it's so complicated, complicated. but... Um, it is. It's an. It's an. It's a necessary evil. I'm just going back to my browser so we can. So we did this one.
Can you guys see this? Oh no, you can't. Good. Okay. Neural net initialization. This exercise using the XOR data again. So the XOR is just what data we're training and testing on. Um, but looks at the repeatability of training neural networks and the importance of initialization. Task one, run the model as given four or five times. Okay. Not looking too good. But not terrible. 0 0.3 is, is quite high, but not catastrophic. Of course, catastrophic or just uh, subjective, but by comparison with our last model at least. Let's see how it's weighting these. 1.4 minus 0 0.95. So blue, blue will be positive because of the um, activation we're using. One will be positive, one will be negative. Blue positive, uh, orange negative. Okay, I think we've done that enough times. Let's see. Um, let each trial run at least 500 steps. Okay, we did like 2,000. <laughs> um, what shape does each model output converge to? Converges to this ugly looking, looks like some kind of international border. It looks like you're in uh, uh, um, Basel in Switzerland, where it's like Germany, France, Switzerland. Um, Let's regenerate it. Oops, that's what we want to do. Um, let each trial, yeah, okay, run uh, right, again. That's uh, conversion to the same thing. I hope you guys can see that it's it's functioning the same way. And this is, of course, what we would do. We would iteratively run it repeatedly run it, not iteratively. Iteratively implies that it changes each time. Task, um, task two, try making the model slightly more complex by adding a layer. Okay, we're going to add one more layer and a couple of nodes. Let's try it. Okay, far better loss. We're doing well here. And remember what this is about. This is about letting the computer add a layer of abstraction. It's about letting it ask essentially another layer of simultaneous questions. That's what's going on here. Reset it. Good, good. Basically converging to the same. What have I done? <laughs> it's messed up. This happens. This does. It's, this is the non-deterministic nature of it. This is why we always sample appropriately. This is a terrible loss. Terrible loss. <laughs> but we were we were as low as one point four. I think zero point one four. Let's see the answer to this one because I'm intrigued. Adding the layer and extra nodes produced more more repeatable results well not in our estimation buddy on each run the, the resulting model looks roughly the same what planet are they on it doesn't look the same at all <laughs> furthermore the converged test loss showed less variance there we go people even sometimes either me or tensorflow is wrong so obviously it's tensorflow 
Okay, let's do this last one. This is, this is on this presentation as well. I'm not gonna go back at the agonized process of going back and forth. This is a very interesting one because it's like, it's a more visual way of, it's, it's where we can, <coughs> we can vary the kind of data set we get. So let's do this, uh, yeah, let's do spiral one. This is the most impossibly difficult, very hard to do. Noisy spiral, noisy, we will discuss this signal to noise ratio. Noisy means it's just not very useful. You couldn't try drawing a line of best fit, fit through that. Impossible. Obviously a linear model will fail, but even manually defined features, feature crosses may be hard to construct. Task one, train the best model you can uh, using just X1 and X2. Um, yeah, guys, remember that the features, we're, at the moment, we're not messing with the features. So we're not, we're going in pretty much blind um, or with very limited uh, feature engineering. So that might be one of the reasons we've got this horrible, horrible loss, uh, uh, loss uh, ranking rating. Um, let's just sort of sake of argument and ugly 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 is it succeeding clearly it's not it's trying to ask questions about but the questions are not working Give it another shot. Screwed up again. Last chance saloon. Similar, incompetent. Okay, so we, we've, we found that spiral data, very difficult. What is the best loss you can get? You know, maybe we could just like, maybe we can, we can, we can, we can cut these, just go, one this is the most extreme example so we really so doing basically nothing having no network at all you get the same result so total redundancy your deep learning model useless this is the time when you resign from your job <laughs> um okay task two even with neural networks some amount of feature engineering is often needed to achieve best performance so as we were saying features which are on the left so you can imagine your in this sense your rows but i think really it's kind of more useful to think about it as columns if you're thinking tabular but um your features like ears if it's a, if it's dogs and cats ears nose etc um you need to you need to do some work on that and this goes back to our discussion in the first session which was rules or machine learning here we have lots of layers lots of machine learning going on but we've we we're starting with so little and with such poor data with, so, with such a uh, confounding um data set don't use confounding in the way i just used it <laughs> um such a uh, a, a, a um, difficult data set but it's not helping us and we need to do some feature engineering so let's do this. Let's try all of them. And more, this, this is a reasonable, no, reasonable. Oh, it's trying. It's trying, but it's it's lower. It's lower. If you see, it's it's trying to isolate the nodes. So in this sense, I'm, I'm referring to it not as a, um, referring to it more as a network. Nodes means network, not as a graph. Graph also means network in some circles, sorry. So in this sense, it's just, it's just I'm not referring to it as a scatter plot. It's making some progress. I mean, like it's, it's gone down from what it was slightly. I mean, but is that significant? I doubt it. Um, Give it one more shot. Mm. It's it's struggling mightily, but it's alas. So I mean, we look here. So 
if you imagine these are our, we can either piece these together with unsupervised learning, or we can have known these. So if we know them, we can kind of look at the shape and go, mm, is that, can I kind of eyeball it? But this one's might be quite good. So let's go, let's go with this one. That seems to be quite useful. Right, my, me eyeballing it has not worked. <laughs> or has it? No, no, it's not working. You see, it took a dive there. It, it, it found some inspiration. It made, it asked one kind of good question and then it. Let's give it some more firepower. Better, better, better. We're getting down to three, six, seven. Three, five. That's not bad. That's not bad. This is a good result. If you were coding this, if you if you don't originally, you'd be you'd be patting yourself on the back. You'd be telling your supervisor, "I'm onto something." <laughs> so, guys, remember what we're doing here. When we get to the, when we get to the programming, which we probably won't tonight, but when we get to the programming, what you want to look at here is say, what was important? What was important, it seems like, was two things. We had the right features, and we gave it something to work with in terms of these hidden layers. Let's see the answer. It's probably the, probably the wrong ones. Oh, wow. So this is the whole presentation. We don't have time to go through this, but um, let me let me guess the answers. Yeah, I, I, well, I've guessed already. The answer is that it, you had you combined. Um, a, a, okay, so training loss zero point two two seven three. Um, you combined. Okay, now, but do you see the difference here between it's it's diverged between test loss and training loss? So this is something we should definitely bear in mind in future, the way it's, it's, so this could be um, contamination where it's kind of learning, it's, the tr it's, it's learning the training data. It's not, so it's not performing better because it knows more, it's learning, it's, it's performing better on the training data because it's, it just knows the training data. So be wary of this sort of thing. Um, that's, that issue of contamination is one that you want to be constantly aware of. In machine learning the most cardinal law of machine learning is keep test and trace separate so that when you improve you you um you're not just anticipating the training training data better you're not just learning the models of that data you're learning it so it can be applied It's like it's like knowing the answers to an exam rather than actually knowing the content of the of the subject. But all in all, okay, it's it's actually it's it's kind of going backwards now. It's 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 trying its best. Let's let's cut our losses. It's done okay. Um, let's go back to the presentation. If it is in my power to navigate this Byzantine complexity of, of online teaching, Kitoki. Okay. Soldiering on limits of neural networks. Uh, okay, okay. So let's, I'm going to give these links to you. These actually are already links. They've just been confusingly written in this, in this way. Copy link URL. Putting it in the chat. This might be one for you guys to uh, kind of reflect on.
This is a, a model which will demonstrate weaknesses and fragility to my memory. A teachable machine is uh, interesting because you can, I think you can break it. You can, you can make it, um, you can give it examples and then get it to the wrong answer. And I think as, I think as we did, we discussed earlier, coming to the wrong answer kind of gives you an insight into what this is doing better than if it came to the right answer, because then you just be like, it's magic, it just, I don't know. But if you see the wrong answer, you can kind of piece together the limitations. I think this might be one for, I don't, I don't want to drag, drag this on too much. Although I could have a quick look. Yeah, I think this is a bit, um, we faffed around a bit too much for, uh, for this, but if you see, you have the link, now you can see that this is a, um, a teachable machine is a great way to explore machine learning in your life. See how it works and its limitations. So y the inputs are yours. So help it learn or break it. Ah, yeah, confused machine. We've reached the end. The voyage, this part of the voyage, the Odyssey is is at an end. I hope you guys have had a um, kind of useful insight into what neural networks are. To summarize, neural networks are, in the words of that Google engineer, also called Greg, or a cartoonish representation of the way that organic brains function. I think that's a very useful definition. I think the most useful definition is that it, um, allows you to segregate and prioritize the, the conclusions that lead to your final output. So you can combine a great many functions. That's one thing. And the second thing is it will iteratively generate functions. And those might go to a level of abstraction that we do not understand. We today have been in control. We've been looking at the um, this useful TensorFlow playground and been trying to understand what the machine does. But most of the time, you won't have that privilege. You will be programming it and you will tell it to do something and it will go away and do this and it will give you an answer. And your business as, as, a, as a machine learning engineer is not necessarily to know everything what it's doing. It's, it's to have an explanation such that you can sort of reverse engineer your own work. But the point is to have is that you have these these layers iteratively chained you can which are then um iteratively altered they can be prioritized they can be weighted and each neuron represents a mathematical function and we've looked at two of those today we look at sigmoid and relu those are the most common sigmoid previously relu now relu because it's more efficient and easier and computationally less computationally less demanding but the point of this is to um break down uh the decision making sort of compartmentalize it modu modularize it and that allows you to introduce new elements iteratively and prioritize i hope that definition is useful there are a thousand definitions that's my definition Oh yeah, when, when is when is it useful? When are, when are neural networks useful? I think the key is for tasks that, um, such as computer vision, which require decisions um, that we cannot easily pin down, and require a level of abstraction that we cannot easily explain. So although it's very easy for us to say, oh, that's a dog, um, we couldn't easily write down rules for what a dog is. And, um, And the, 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 this process helps us piece together what really matters in determining whether it's a dog or not. And it allows us to 
again, iteratively improve um, in, a, in a more uh, concise and um, flexible way. What can it do that a simpler model might not be able to do? So it's essentially asking what is the difference between say um, a, 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 a regression model in machine learning and this and a new on the neural network. It's a difficult one, since in, in, in neural networks are a subset of machine learning. But I think the, the conclusion you, that we want to come to about when to use it. First off, try machine learning. Try your normal uh, machine learning. And then from that, um, if, there's, if, there's, if there's a missing factor, uh, if, there's, if you're unable to progress, that's when deep, deep learning really comes into play. It's something I think that given the complexity of the task and the computational power required, you don't want to, we don't want to, you don't want to habitually use and overuse. You want, to, you want to use it when it's appropriate. And it's appropriate for tasks that contain steps that we can't easily see. We know our features, we might know our features. We might be able to introduce the features initially. We might have to introduce them through unsupervised learning, but we don't have the hidden layers. We've got to let the, the, uh, the algorithms available to us determine those hidden layers and then change them as appropriate as, it's, as the trained model is tested. So again, it's a matter of abstraction. What is the limitation of a neural network? Well, as we've seen, sometimes um, we can make it over, it can, it, can, it can be redundancies. And that's very expensive. Redundancies are very, very expensive. Um, in general, deep learning is probably overused. Um, it's a buzzword and buzz phrase, and so it's overused. And Kind of consequently, there's a lot of unnecessary co computational uh, power being applied to what might otherwise be solved problems, or although that's a somewhat conservative approach. Um, I think the main limitation that you want to be aware of with neural networks is the extent to which um, there's redundancy and um, the level of abstraction might be beyond our understanding and might therefore raise questions of ethics. This uh, course was devised with Google by Google AI in, and Google CrowdSource. So if you want to check out more CrowdSource resources, including applications of what we talked about today, then you can do so by going to CrowdSource website, CrowdSource website, and downloading the app if you want to. It's all free. Okay, this is, this is basically uh, explaining CrowdSource. Um, be aware of it, you get credit for your contributions. It's, it's by playing these games and experimenting with it and learning, you're also contributing. Who doesn't want to do that? Okay, that is pretty much the end. Um, I'll send you the post workshop form um, and any questions? Vera. It went over your head a little bit. So it went over my head for years. I've been doing this for like three years. And first year I was like, get away. I don't want to know about neural networks. The crash course is, is useful, but you know, I, I would recommend is a website called Kaggle, which is K-A-G-G-L-E dot com, <coughs> which introduces you through um, a, a, a machine learning framework called Scikit-Learn. Um, it's not a Google product, but it's, it's in my view, it's the best introductory um, system for machine learning. So if you want to go to Kaggle Introduction to Machine Learning, I would recommend doing that actually before or alongside the crash course. The crash course, you can get lost in the material. It's, I think when I, I, I refer to it as a dictionary, it's more useful as a dictionary. So if you have a problem, you can go to it. If you want to get started with this, the best way would be to go to um, Kaggle, in my view. You can get practical, practical coding exercises and really understand a sort of pattern match. I learn by doing, so the sort of lecture like I just gave would be totally useless to me. Um, and um, next time I think we'll be doing 
um, real computer programming. If you go back to those to the link that I gave you with the playground at the bottom of that, there's actually a link to a Google Colab, which is an online co programming script which you can run through, and it contains an example of machine learning and the programming behind machine learning. Which uh, um, it so Google Colab is like uh, yeah, it's just like programming online, but in this case they've given you all of the instructions. Okay, so that's that's my conclusion. If you want to relearn really um, this stuff, I would go to Kaggle. Um, you can also just go to YouTube and look up various um, tutorials. That's really unhelpful advice. I was in I was in tutorial hell for many many months um, some years ago, and uh, you can just get sucked in, and not really learn. But um, yeah, okay, great guys. So thank you so much for joining. As I said, this is going to be on um, uh, Google AI. It's going to be on the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Google Group, YouTube, and various other platforms, and will be supported by the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, community in general. Okay, so until next time, there's going to be an, a, a machine learning newsletter soon. So if you're not already subscribed, if you're not already a member of the group, the Google Developer uh, Student Club group, subscribe um or just become a member there's no, there's no cost and you'll get notifications of new tutorials and probably simpler tutorials than this and um also useful exercises advice events lots of cool stuff okay so um that's it and thanks everyone um see you uh see you next time Okay.